This is Canada. From sea to sea, and home to this big red maple leaf. And it should be no surprise to you that each and every province has a flag, as well as a decent amount of cities and towns throughout the country. That means Canada has a lot of flags. In the previous episode, we started in what we called Eastern Canada, and in each episode we're going to move west until we hit the west coast. In this episode, we're going to focus on Central Canada. Why did we split up the country in this way? Simply so that each area could have roughly the same amount of time. And if you haven't seen the first episode yet, go ahead and check it out after this video. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below. Now, were you aware that there were rules of what makes a good flag and a bad flag? Let's do a quick rundown. According to the North American Vexillological Association, Number one, keep it simple. A flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. Number two, use meaningful symbolism. A flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. Number three, use two or three basic colors to limit the number of colors on the flag. Four, no lettering or seals. Never use any type of writing or any kind of organizational seal on a flag. And number five, be distinctive or be related. Avoid duplications of other flags, but use similarities to show connections if warranted. So with that in mind, let's check out flags of Canadian cities. We begin our journey in the territory of Nunavut in the region of Kagiktaluk, the capital city, Iqaluit. Now, according to the rules set up by Nava, technically the flag of Iqaluit would have many flag sins, but personally, I think it's pretty cool. And quite frankly, there are many cool flags in Nunavut, but we don't have time to go through them all. I present to you Iqaluit's flag. The flag you see here is actually a revision of the older city flag that came from 1986. This revised version was actually restyled by a graphic artist at a business in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Prior to Iqaluit becoming Iqaluit, the area was used as an Inuit summer camp. The bay was known for good fishing, and that's where they caught fish. But the first established settlement was in 1942, when the United States built an airbase during World War II, known as Frobisher Bay Air Base. Iqaluit was known as Frobisher Bay until 1987. The flag's design is based off a Canadian pale design, but instead of red ends, the ends are blue. At the center of the flag is a design. At the top of this design, we see what appears to be mountains, and they are mountains. The Everett Mountains. The river coming from the Everett Range is the Sylvia Grinnell River that flows into Frobisher Bay, which happens to be represented by the upside-down triangles that sort of are the reflection of the mountain range. And below the lighter blue, we have three fish, showing the viewer that Frobisher Bay is a hot spot in a cold land for fishing, and always has. Lastly, we have one of the biggest sins, text on your flag, but I personally think it's okay here, because you got Iqaluit in English above, and then you got Iqaluit in the native language below. I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. And it's a neat way to see the native language. It's sort of proudly plastered on there for people to see. I also enjoy how this newer flag revises the older 1980s flag and just kind of elevates it a little bit. And if there is another iteration of this flag, it'll be fun to see how it evolves. This flag gets three big fish from me. Good job. Ottawa, the capital of Canada. The city itself is known for being quite divisive because of politics, and we all know how divisive politics can be. But did you know that Ottawa is also known for its flag, which is equally as divisive? Or it was? Let me explain. In an attempt to be inclusive, Ottawa created a flag that created division among its citizens, and was known for being one of the ugliest flags in Canada. The original flag was adopted in 1901, and was a tricolor design, with three different colors representing different things. The purple represented the monarchy, while the red represented the liberals, and the blue the conservatives. In 1987, they tried to make the flag look better, and they slapped the coat of arms on there, but yeah, it doesn't look that good. But then finally in 2000, they decided to throw the flag away. Despite it being the oldest municipal flag in Canada, they started all over, threw away the politics, and made a brand new flag. This time a flag designed by a commercial design firm. And here it is. 
a big change from the previous one. As we can see, the colors are blue, a teal green, white, and there's a big spiraling O in the center. The little streamers shooting off of the O are supposed to be reminiscent of local architecture, such as the Parliament building, and yeah, you know, I, I can see that. I can see kind of the tower there, you know? Uh, anyways, each little streamer thing is supposed to also represent a quality of Canadian life, symbolizing hope, harmony, and working together towards a common goal. The O is obviously for Ottawa, whilst the blue is for the river and the waterways that surround the community. The green is for the quality of life. The green spaces, the parks, the trees. And yeah, I think it's a nice looking flag. For some reason, the O reminds me of like a conch shell. So I think of this flag as like a coastal community or a seaside community. I, I don't really see it as the capital city's flag. But I think it's a nice flag. You can also view the center of that O as a pit where all of your taxpayer money goes and you never see results come from it. That's another way of seeing this flag. Other than that, I think it's time for us to move on! We begin our trek to the Golden Horseshoe region, to the shores of Lake Ontario, to the city of Oshawa. The city's flag was adopted in 1974, after a contest held throughout the city, and the flag made use of the city's coat of arms that were adopted in 1952. And in the most Canadian thing ever, in 1967, they added a beaver to the coat of arms. So in the center of this blue flag is a simplified version of the city's coat of arms, encircled by two rings of 15 stylized rows petals. The outer ring is white while the inner ring is yellow. The primary colors on this flag, the blue, white, and yellow, are also the colors of the city of Oshawa. And why the rose petals? The rose is the official flower of the city. As we zoom in on this coat of arms, we can see it split into different tiers. The upper tier is golden yellow with three different gears, with the central one being larger than the others. The center of the gears are blue and the outer part is red. This symbolizes the industry within the city. The next tier from left to right shows a sailing ship, a winged wheel, and a flying bird, all in a golden yellow. The ship stands for waterborne commerce, which today is done through the port of Oshawa, which can be seen in this video of ours. The winged wheel is for transportation on land, and the bird is for the Oshawa airport. The final tier has three green maple leaves. They symbolize Ontario, Canada, and I don't, that's all it is. It symbolizes two things, but there's three of them. They couldn't come up with a meaning for three different maple leaves. That's okay. We'll end on the very top of the coat of arms, which has that beaver they added in 1967. And that beaver is there because it is the national animal of Canada. I'm sure a lot of you thought it was the moose. So how do I like the flag, I hear none of you asking? Personally, I like it. I think it looks really nice. I think it has nice colors. I do like how the center looks like a rose, which would kind of tie in with the city's official flower being a rose. Plus, there's a lot of good symbolism to boot. Overall, nice flag. Toronto, Ontario is the largest city in Canada and home to this flag. It is a flag I personally love. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as good in person. I'm going to say it, it really doesn't. Right here on a computer or on a TV screen, it looks great. But in person, on a flagpole, it doesn't look as good. Let's go into it. In the 1970s, the city was looking for a new flag and created a contest that all citizens could join. The eventual winner was a college student, 21-year-old Rabo Renato DeSantis. So jumping right into it, we have a flag of blue, white, and red. There's a red maple leaf for the country of Canada. The white represents the City Hall of Toronto, which can really be seen in photos. That white is also the outline for the letter T, which can be seen in the center in blue. The T stands for Toronto, or Toronto, as many locals say it. There's actually two T's. You got the blue T in the middle, and the white, of course, is a T as well. And that's it. That's the whole symbolism for the flag of Toronto. The colors don't really have any deep symbolism or anything like that, but it is cool that the white does have the outline of the city hall. And while I truly enjoy this flag here on paper or on the screen, when you see it in person, it just doesn't look right. Like the bottom portion is too heavy or something. And, and usually when you see it, it's never like flat, straight out, so 
you can see the whole design, it's usually blocked partially, or there's folds, and you just don't get to see it all. And it's really a shame. But it's still one of my favorite designs for a Canadian city flag. It just looks better in practice than when it's actually out there on the pole. It is actually for this very reason that there are several movements online to try and get the city to change its flag, but nothing has really been taken seriously yet. So we'll keep an eye on it to see if Toronto does indeed get a new flag in the future. We next head to the industrial city of Hamilton to check out their flag. The flag also features a Canadian pale design, with the ends being yellow and the center being blue. Inside that blue center we see a circular chain, followed by a five-sided flower in the center. The five-sided flower is for the House of Hamilton, or Clan Hamilton, from the Scottish Lowlands back in Scotland. Origins to the clan themselves date back as far as 1294. So even though the city was founded by a man by the name of George Hamilton, the flag's designer decided to use this symbolism from Scotland instead. Hamilton is a very industrial city and is known for its major port. <laughs> Check out that video again. I'll stop doing that. Nearly Hamilton's entire waterfront is made of heavy industry, including the steel industry. And that chain represents the industry, the steel industry. On that chain, you'll notice six bigger loops. Each of those loops represent the six original communities that formed Hamilton. You got Hamilton, Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Glanbrook, and Stony Creek. The flag was officially granted to the city on July 15, 2003, and was created by Anglican Bishop Ralph Spence. I think this is a really good looking flag. I love the blue and how it matches with that golden yellow. I also think the chain representing industry, as well as representing the six original communities that form Hamilton today, uh, it's like they're linked together, you know? It's pretty cool. And then you got that Scottish heritage, even if the guy who founded the city was not Scottish. But his dad was. He was an immigrant directly from Scotland. Hamilton. Good flag. For our next flag, we head to London. N no, the, the other London. Th there, there. Okay. We head to London, Ontario. And I like to call this flag the library flag because it looks like a library book or a logo for a library. You see that L, the green there on the side with the lighter gray? That is supposed to be an L for the city of London, that's fine, but all I see are pages of a book. So it's a pretty simple flag. On the right hand side we see the words London Canada because, you know, they gotta let people know that there is a London in Canada. But that is also a flag sin because you have words on the flag. There are supposed to be no words on the flag. Second, above that, we have the corporate logo for the city, which is a tree that was designed in 1980. So pretty much we just have a logo on the flag. On the left hand side of the flag, we see a green and silver L shape. The green L actually represents nothing, but the city is known as the forest city, so I'm going to pretend that it actually means forests. Green trees, you know, okay? The silver is supposed to symbolize, and I quote, the opportunity the municipality offers to its existing and prospective citizens. Ah, uh, okay. Honestly, this flag just looks like a library card. I don't hate it, but come on, you can do better than this, London. There's no credited creator of this flag, so we don't know who did it. I mean, seriously, this could just be like... <laughs> A bus pass. There's zero effort into this. Let's go to the next flag. In the 1970s, Thunder Bay was holding a competition for a brand new city flag. The winner's flag was chosen in 1972 and adopted as the city's official flag. It was designed by Cliff Redden, and here's the flag. If you remove the maple leaf, it actually makes me think of like a flag somewhere in Australia for a city. Maybe like Alice Springs with Ayers Rock in the background. Anyways, let's talk about the flag. The yellow, or golden sky, is the rising sun behind Sleeping Giant, which looms over the city. The green is Sleeping Giant. The blue on the bottom is for Lake Superior, which the city is located on. The sun is represented by a giant maple leaf. It should also be worth noting that green and gold are the official colors for the city of Thunder Bay. I wouldn't say it's a bad flag, but I wouldn't say it's a good flag either, but it's okay. I don't think green and yellow and red necessarily go together. And I don't know, I don't think it looks good that the maple leaf extends beyond Sleeping Giant there, the green in the middle. 
I think it looks kind of like tacked on. Really, I think it's time for Thunder Bay to have a brand new flag, because this flag is several decades old, and honestly, it's starting to look it. Winnipeg, Manitoba's largest city, had their flag adopted in 1975 and is a flag of blue, white, and yellow, with the city seal in the center. Starting with the blue, the blue represents the blue clear skies above Winnipeg, which you'll have a hard time finding in the winter, and the gold represents the wheat, which used to be the dominant economic driver for the city, and is still pretty important in the province. As we zoom in here to the coat of arms, at the very top we see the words Winnipeg. Below that we see a stone structure. That stone arch is all that remains of a former Hudson's Bay Company trading post, known as Fort Gary. Below that are 13 different stars that represent the former 13 municipal governments, which combined in 1971 to form Metropolitan Winnipeg. Below that, we have a crocus flower, which grows naturally in the prairies. And below that, we have a ribbon with the Latin words reading, One with the strength of many. As if telling the viewer that all of these municipalities came together, all these people came together to create Winnipeg. And the flag gets a big... Eh, for me, it's okay. I think there's actually a lot of potential with this flag. If you get rid of that coat of arms, you have blue, white, and yellow. Those are all great colors to work with. Maybe there'll be someone who designs a new flag in the future. But as of right now, there are no movements to change the city's flag. But there are movements to change the province's flag. That's a different story, though. Let me start by saying that Saskatchewan as a province has almost no city flags. But today, we're going to check out Saskatoon, which has this flag and a couple variations that are very similar. Just slightly different colors. So let us start with the most complicated part of the flag, the coat of arms. At the very top, we have a lion, because all coat of arms look better with a lion. That lion is holding a Saskatoon berry, yum yum, which grow naturally in the prairie lands of the province. On the left side in the center of the coat of arms is an open book, which is for the University of Saskatchewan, education. On the right hand side, we have a cog with a piece of wheat in the center. That stands for the agricultural industry. At the bottom of the shield, we have a circle with eight parallel lines radiating out from it. This represents the importance of Saskatoon as a railway and distribution center for the prairies. The golden circle in the center also represents commerce. Wheat, one of the most important crops for all of Saskatchewan, weave around the sides of the shield. And below that, we have the words commerce, industry, and education, all of which are represented on the shield. Gold and green are the city's official colors. Green is for the growing of crops, and gold is for harvest, which is why those colors appear all over the flag. The seven yellow stripes are for the city's seven districts. Then lastly, we have the green part of the flag, which has a Saskatoon berry on it. The same berries being held by the lion. Yum yum. The city council chose this flag out of four different designs in 1952. The flag was made by two people, Deck Whitehead and Henry Myrtle. And there you go, that is Saskatoon's flag. It certainly has a lot of symbolism, and it's certainly not so very pleasing to look at. While I couldn't find an official source, I do think the flag is also reminiscent, at least in the colors, of the flag of Saskatchewan, and I think that is pretty neat. And with that, we have one more flag left in a city that straddles the Alberta and Saskatchewan province line. This is Lloydminster. And Lloydminster is quite unique because both provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta, recognize it as one single city, as one entity. So, even though it's in two provinces, it's incorporated in both as one single municipal administration. Meanwhile, their flag seems to celebrate the unique position that Lloydminster is in. Right away, one notices a blue and green background separated by a black line, and in the very center, a city seal. Let's talk about the city seal, because at the very top, it says the city of Lloydminster, using the oil derrick in the center as somewhat of a dividing line. From that oil derrick, we see a line go down through the strata of the earth, and at the very tip of the shield, we see black, which stands for oil, black gold, because Lloydminster is known as the heavy oil capital of Canada. To the left of this oil derrick, we have cattle, and to the right, we have wheat, both very important agricultural industries in the city, while in the background we have forests and rolling hills, following the geography of Lloydminster. Behind the city seal 
is a large, thick black line which represents the border between Saskatchewan and Alberta. On the left in the blue is Alberta, with the Alberta Provincial Flower, a wild rose. While on the right is green for Saskatchewan, with the Saskatchewan Provincial Flower, the Western Red Lily. And I gotta say, while it's definitely not my favorite flag in the world, I think it's kind of neat because this is a unique community being separated as such, and they do a fairly good job at representing that. I do think it could be done in a nicer way though. Maybe in a more modern way, featuring modern design principles on flags, but I'm sure they have more important things to do than thinking about a city flag. And those are the flags from what we call Central Canada. We're heading from the east to the west of Canada, and in our final episode, we will be talking about Western Canada. So be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. You can even check out our Patreon, as well as all of our other videos. We focus on North America, so videos about the United States, Canada, and Mexico, with an emphasis on flags. So if you like flags, check out our other flag videos. Anyways, we'll see you in the next one, and remember to fly your flag high.